That is too funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're sitting here with uh, Coach Russ Bergman. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. It shows that we're streaming live. I can't see it yet, but we're going to start in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Coach Scott Fields with another edition of the Coach Scott Fields Show. And I've got a longtime buddy on here with me, an outstanding basketball mind, basketball expert coach that, and when you look at his resume, success simply follows him everywhere he goes. Coach Russ Bergman down in South Carolina today. Coach, how are you, my friend? Scott, I'm doing great. It's great to be here in South Carolina. We got sunshine and got the beach and got golf and it's just a great, great place to live. Zay, so you've got some great color on your skin right there. I'm looking like mayonnaise compared to you, my friend. <laughs> I've been playing my share of golf. Adam, hey, I am not mad at you. Well, Coach, I appreciate you being selfless and taking time from your golf schedule uh, to come on and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, talking basketball because – you know, you're one of the guys that every NBA summer league, I love to connect with just to hang out and spend time with you and, you know, just catch up and see how things are going. So for us to connect on this right now is, uh, is going to be a lot of fun. We always had a lot of fun out in Vegas at the NBA summer league. That's right. You know, look at those players trying to decide which ones aren't going to make an NBA team and which one maybe we could take to the CBA or possibly sign overseas. That's right. And you've done a great job with that every year. Uh, you know, going back, looking at, you know, all the successes that you've had. Uh, of course, you know, you were at App State and you're at Coastal Carolina, did a great job building those programs. But of course, you were an Army captain before that. How much being in the Army and being a captain led to your career path? And how did that affect your coaching style and personality? Well, it just, you know, just added to the leadership skills. Actually, I wasn't in very, very long in the Army because of the Vietnam War cooled down and came back. And I was lucky. They let me out early. If I wanted to change my branch assignment, I could. But I said, no, I want to go ahead and start my, my career in coaching. So I was very fortunate that the Vietnam era shut down about the time I was supposed to go over there. Gotcha. Well, that's a lucky break for basketball because basketball needs – basketball minds like you have and you've been successful uh, again uh, gosh NCAA uh, CBA uh, international with FIBA I mean wherever you go success follows you because of that culture that you bring to whatever club or franchise that you're with coach well I think the main thing I try to make sure I'm surrounded by great players and great assistant coaches and sometime especially over in Europe you know a lot of times I was assistant doing the consulting, doing the, the advising rather than, you know, I was suggesting instead of making final decisions. Yeah, well, and hey, they were fortunate to have you because again, uh, the success and, and we can see over your shoulder the multiple medals that you've got there and championships that, that have been won. And uh, there's, there's gotta be some great stories, you know, with, with all that because I too have had a great career overseas and man, I could, I could share, I, I could probably write three books <laughs> on, uh, on, the, on the international experiences, as you know. Well, I, I have one started, I hope to finish it, but you know, those medals represent a lot of, a lot of games over and especially in Russia and the Russian league. Yeah. The Cup, Euro league, a Euro challenge. Uh, I even coached one year in Doha, Qatar. Yep. So, you know, I also spent a year in Estonia. So I was in that in years. Been fantastic for the travel and the experience and all the different talent they have over there is amazing. Yeah, you know, and you know, you talk about Russia and for a lot of people who don't know or follow European basketball, Russia is a very elite level over there. I mean, it's good basketball. There's great local players. And then when you sprinkle in a couple, you know, NBA cusp level players, that's an entertaining product that's out there really competing. It really is. You know, Russia is one of the country that has put a lot of money into their basketball teams. And, you know, the players follow the money. So basically the players sign with Russia, they sign with Turkey, they sign with Spain. You know, basically those are the three countries that are pretty good from top to bottom. There's some countries, you know, whether it's Israel with Maccabi, they play, may play one or two teams or maybe like Italy, maybe one team. And, and of course, like in Lithuania, one or two teams, but not from top to bottom like Russia does and like Turkey and Spain. 
Yeah, see, I agree. I That's just such a great level of basketball. And you mentioned Qatar. I actually coached in Qatar and we were successful and we won the Emir Cup. And then we also won another cup there. And we actually had to beat Ray on to win that cup. So they, I mean, they win championships year after year, kind of like a traditional powerhouse. So for you to be able to go over there and, and help them, you know, retain that success, uh, that that's a great honor because again, uh, the level's a little bit different, but they have a lot of great um, African athletes that come over that, you know, get nationalized and, and do a great job there. They do. I had a kid named uh, Tangi Nagumbo. He was from the Congo. And mm -hmm. matter of fact, he's the one that got drafted and after the draft, they found out later on that he lied on his passport. Oh, and wow. They, yeah. And so basically this happens because what they would do in, in Qatar, Qatar, they would bring him from Africa at an early age, like 13. And sometimes they say they were 13, actually, when they were 15 or 16, when yeah. they came in there, just so they would be eligible to play on their teams and also play on the national team. Yeah. But, and, you know, sometimes. Again, again, Scott, I yeah. was just surrounded by great players. and he was one of them yeah and a lot of times coach I really don't even know if it's truly the player's fault because the player may not really even know but it's more of a government issue where they put those players that the players like man they just want to play and they they don't know all that information so I can't really pin that on the players well that may be true because I asked him several times you know are you sure this is you know your this is your right age you know your draft eligible blah 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 and he told me he was, so I was shocked when it came out that supposedly he was older than what said. Yeah, and see, and that and that's too bad because it basically it's it's more of a governmental or you know their federation issue uh, where they've you know tried to use the kid in other facets. So uh, right. I, I get it because again, I've I've been there, I've seen it, and, and it happens. And again, a lot of times the player is not even aware of it. So I'm sure he wasn't giving you misinformation. He probably just didn't know, and he was being honest with you. And then here we are trying to take the information that's given to us that maybe third or fourth handed. And again, it's international. You just don't know. That's right. It was a tough one for the Minnesota Timberwolves to deal with. That's for sure. Oh, I bet. I bet. Well, coach, I mean, again, you, you've even had great success in, in the CBA when the CBA was by far, you know, the feeder uh, league to go into the NBA. And I think you had like 28, 30 players that were, were called up from the CBA. Uh, great success with uh, Great Lakes and then also OKC Calvary. Talk to us a little bit about those CBA days because, again, that's that's when the CBA was strong and, and what a great culture the CBA had at that time. No question. You know, we only had between eight to 12 teams and you know, the D-League, or they call it the G-League now because of Gatorade, they have almost as many teams as they do in the NBA, 28 or 29 or 30. I'm not exactly how many they have now. Yeah. So it wasn't near as watered down. In order to Great make, point. In order to make a roster in the CBA, you had to be a heck of a player. And there were a lot of players from the NBA, former NBA players that were in, uh, actually, uh, were coming back to the, to the CBA, trying to get back to the NBA. I know... To give you a story, Jim Sleeper, my assistant, we were getting ready to play the team in Rapid City. Matter of fact, Eric Musman was coaching that that team at the time. And uh, Sleeper came in before the game. He says, Coach, he said, you won't believe this. He said, but nine out of the ten players that were coached against tonight or playing against tonight are former NBA first-round picks. I said, wow. really? are you kidding me? I said, that's hard to believe. He said, well, you got to remember that. A lot of them, they got the three-year no cut, but after that, there's no guarantee. So some of them may have been put there four or five. So that got me fired up. And of course, then I relayed that to the players and got them fired up. They had, every team had to have one, has to have one rookie back in the CBA. And so the one rookie, of course, wasn't a, a first round draft pick, but we were fortunate to go out and really play well and, and get a win on the road. You know, you're talking about the level of the players, which was fantastic at that time, but also the level of coaching that was in the CBA. I mean, talk about some of the coaches, because again, coach, you're right there and you win a CBA championship. So I want people to know and understand we've got a great basketball mind who's on this show sharing insight right now. So share some of the coaches that were in the CBA, when, you know, when you're coaching in that league at that time. Well, first of all, we've been talking about Eric Musselman, you know, with the Florida Beach Dogs and with the team in Rapid City. Eric did a great job. He was yeah. unbelievable finding talent and bringing it into his team. He was always loaded with talent. But every year, he just got better and better as a coach. And I just can't say enough for him 
you know, he paid the price when, when they shut down the Florida beach dogs. He went with Orlando, paid his dues there. Then he got in with Atlanta. Next thing you know, he's a head NBA coach. So yeah, with golden state and then Sacramento. So, yep. but you know, even when, even though he had some pretty good teams there, you know, it's tough to stay in the NBA for sure. And then yeah. he goes back to college, starts, you know, being an assistant at LSU, then works his way up, gets a head job in Nevada, does an unbelievable great job in yes. the Nevada, getting them into the top 20 and keeping them there. And then from there, catapults and get the job, got the job at Arkansas and then won 20 this year. So I can't say enough about how proud I am of Eric Musselman. He's, he's doing a super job and I'm sure he will continue to do a super job. Yeah, well, again, look at look at some of the names. I mean, like Mo McCone was in it, and then of course, right. you know, Bill, which was Eric's father, was in it. You had George Carl, uh, that was in the CBA for a while. You had, of course, Phil Jackson in right. the CBA. So again, that that list. Uh, I mean, even um, well, Flip Saunders, Panaggio, yeah, Flip Saunders. Flip I mean, yeah. So I mean, again, look at those names. Flip wow. Saunders, and then you got Mike Tebow, who just won a WNBA championship last summer. That's right. So another great coach, Mo Mahone, a fantastic coach. He was always my nemesis, extremely difficult to beat. But, you know, uh, Skip, uh, like we said, uh, Flip Saunders, an unbelievable great coach. And he went up to the NBA and did a super job with Minnesota, as you know well. Then he went to Washington with the Wizards and and had a great, great NBA career. So there's yeah. several what coaches that have come out of there, like you said, George Carl and all of them. It's just being at the right place, the right time, you know, it's all timing and somebody giving you a break to get in the league. Well, you know, that's, that's well said because that's, that's basically all that is because obviously you could be on an NBA bench and being a valuable asset to a franchise because of your expertise and your knowledge and your wisdom and insight. And the thing is your ability to teach is also outstanding. And that's why, again, everywhere you've gone, you've been such a great asset to whatever bench at whatever level, no matter where on the globe you've been. So I, I want to sing those praises because I know you'll be humble and you won't, but coach, you've, done a great job everywhere and man like i'm saying an nba bench would be lucky to have you well being a head coach all those years really helped me to be a good assistant when i went to europe and make sure that i when i gave him a suggestion i thought it was something that would really work for us or might work but at the same time i realized that they're the one making the final decision yeah. i'm just making the suggestion just like when i used to be a head coach whether it's in college or the cba or whatever you know, I expected them. I said, look, make sure you give me suggestions because I want you to make me think during the game, challenge me during the game. Yeah. But just because I don't do what you want me to do to go from a man to his own doesn't mean I'm not listening to you. You know, I have to make the final decisions. And that's what being the head coach is. You make the final decision. You got to go with your gut and go with sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Just like sometime an assistant makes a suggestion and you take it and it works or you take it and it doesn't work but that doesn't mean it was a bad suggestion that's exactly right and i think that's a great point because the the more that you allow the assistant coaches to have ownership in what they're providing to you that's going to keep everybody stimulated and keep everybody involved and not just have wallflowers so i think that's a great point for young coaches who are coming up to the ranks trying to slide over just another chair yeah, you, as an assistant, you have to do everything you can to make the head coach's job easier. Yes. Especially in practice, do everything you can, to prepare for practice, make it easier for them, and do everything you can with the drills and, and try to make sure you regurgitate to the players everything they say. Make sure you run the pick and roll like you want them to run it, whether it's a side, middle pick and roll, uh, whatever. So yeah. I think it's very important that, you know, you make sure you say the same things over and over again, what the head coach is wanting them to do. That's exactly right. And, and, and I think, you know, you hit on a, a key facet, you know, talking about loyalty and, you know, and having that experience and expertise, because look how many on NBA benches now, coach, how many former NBA head coaches are assistants because they want that guy on the bench that's had that experience and that knowledge and they kind of see things through a different perspective and a different lens that can add value to input for game decisions and, and game management and you know whether it's sideline out of bounds baseline out of bounds plays you know different adjustments to make on the fly during a game uh, that that's just valuable valuable information for any coach to have on that bench 
And you said the key word, loyalty, at any level, whether you're assistant or head coach, especially being assistant, you have to be loyal. That's why the NBA head coaches, they choose so particular and so wisely to make sure that they don't bring somebody in that stabs them in the back and all at once, next thing you know, they're fired and that guy takes over as head coach. So they want to make sure it's somebody that's going to be extremely loyal to them, but it also loyalty goes back to being a college coach and a high school coach. You have to have assistants that have your back at all times. Hey, 100%. I, I actually uh, had to experience that one time and it was not comfortable. Uh, and it was in a country where I went in and the guy that they named my assistant was the former head coach that I replaced. They said, but we want him to be there so you can groom him. So that way he'll be comfortable to step in in a couple of years for you. And I was thinking to myself, well, I don't know if this is comfortable. And we had service conversations. And of course, we got it going and we started winning. We started having success. And the next thing you know, wow. <laughs> it happened. And I was like, and, and my wife came down for a visit and she was the one who said, babe, you need to be careful because she says, she goes, I don't have a good vibe on this guy. And so she called it out before I even noticed it. And I'm like, oh, he's, I, I, we're good. I'm not even worried about it. Sure enough, he did. <laughs> well, the problem is you didn't, you couldn't, you couldn't control that. When you took the job, they said, this guy is definitely going to be your assistant. Yep. So there's yep. really nothing else you could have done. Yeah. Yeah. But, but again, it's one of those things that reinforces and reiterates the point that you're making right. that loyalty is, is, is just a huge asset to have. And it is a must for quality assistance to be with you. So that way, everybody's on the same page. Everybody has the same agenda. Everybody's using the same terminology and no one is out to do things for themselves and do things to harm the, the chemistry of the team. Right. For sure. For yeah. sure. Very well, good. let let's go back to the CBA stuff. Uh, Cause again, I'm, I'm just so intrigued by that culture that was going on in the CBA when you were there and, and had success. Uh, what were some of those bus trips? Like what were some of those probably 16 hour trips, uh, you know, in Sioux Falls or, or wherever you may have been going out to Montana. And I mean, I can imagine what some of those trips were like and probably trying to grab a newspaper early in the morning to read the box scores and see who's being, you know, out of an NBA contract. Can we hear up and get them in? I mean, share some of those stories with us, coach. Well, you know, I was fortunate to be in Oklahoma City because we were so far away from the other teams. We had to fly everywhere. Oh, uh, nice. The only time we took a bus trip is if we went, say, from Chicago to Rockford. Yeah. Then we would take a bus. Or let's say we were in possibly Sioux Falls and went to Omaha. There you go. Um, we even one time, even Boise, Idaho, when I was there, we took a bus to Yakima, Washington. And I'm glad we only did that one time. <laughs> going across going across that mountain pass in the winter is not fun. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we had one night when we were flying back from Yakima and uh, the snow and just unbelievable wind and crazy getting over the mountains. And and then they the the pilot, the female pilot came on and said, you know, we're we're running short of fuel and, and there's a there's a plane off the runway in Seattle. So I'm not sure what we're gonna do. And I have yeah. to hate to sound prejudiced, but I was a little bit concerned with that female pilot up there. <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, anyway, that... we kept staying in the air, circling, and she said, "Well, we may have to go land into Portland." Then, then the then the uh, the captain or the co-pilot came on, and there was another female. So anyway, that that got my attention real quick, and so finally they got the plane off the runway and we landed safely there in, in Seattle, but wow. always scary in the CBA and in some of those plane flights. But a lot of times, you know, you play so many games in the CBA, uh, just like you do in the NBA, but we, we were flying commercial and like the old NBA used to. And so you didn't have the luxury of getting in a private plane after the game or the next morning, we were always taking the first flight out just like the old NBA used to. Yep. So you may be playing in Sioux Falls on one night, and the next night you may be playing in Rockford, Illinois. And so I know sometimes I would wake up on the plane and, I, I, and I'd have to ask the flight attendant, you know, where are we going? Because I wasn't even for sure where <laughs> we're going at that point, who we were playing. Uh, yeah. Because you just get mixed up. It's kind of like you get on the elevator and you get ready to go up your room and you say, oh, my gosh what room number I'm in now. You got to go back down the front desk to get your room. <laughs> it's kind of crazy that way. Oh man. I, 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 
I, I remember just taking some crazy bus trips ourselves. Uh, and again, I was in the CBA when, of course, this was after Isaiah Thomas had bought it and it wasn't the same CBA. And, you know, there was one owner who owned four teams and then trying to logistically get things you know, taking care of and get your per diem and then take care of your travel, make sure you're on the bus, getting to the hotels, getting things set up and all the, all the, you know, logistical things with, with setting up hotels. So there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't realize you have to do. And, uh, you know, there was one time I remember in the CBA coach, our players didn't even want to play because they weren't even getting per diem and they were going to stop our franchise, but we went into the franchise that they were going to keep and we ended up beating that team on the road and they, they weren't very happy with us <laughs> i'm sure they weren't i mean cba you know the th great part about to me coaching the cba these athletes were extremely motivated to get to the next level yeah kind of like a junior college to get to a four-year school right therefore it made it much easier for practice and of course for games and of course they all want playing time and of course their agents wanted all of them to play 48 minutes sure not, you know and everybody can't play 48 minutes so it was extremely challenging, but the thing I loved about it, you know, after coaching the NAI Division II, then Division I against some, a lot of Hall of Famers, you know, whether it be Bobby Knight or, or Huggins or whether it be Red Myers, NAA Hall of Famer, uh, Neil Gordon, I could go on and on about the different great college coaches that I've coached against. But in the CBA, what makes you so a much better coach is all the special situations you go to because of the quarter score. Yes, you, you got that? points for each quarter, yes. Right. You, actually, you didn't win the game by the score. You won it because of the quarter score. If you, would get, you, would get, you would get three points if you won the game and a point for each quarter. And so at the end of every quarter, you'd be calling timeout just like it was the end of the game, running a special situation so you could win that quarter if the score was close. So – through that, it, it just makes you a much, much better coach. I think the other thing that really challenges you, that makes you a better coach, when the NBA calls up your, your player, it's always your best player. It's not yeah. number eight or number nine on yeah. the team. It's your best player. And then all at once you got a game to play that night, like you may be on a road trip and you're flying through Minneapolis, in Minneapolis and there's a, a loud a, a, a message for you on the loudspeaker and it says for you to go to the Delta desk, you get there, and it's the Houston Rockets, and they say, Coach, this is uh, so-and-so with the Houston Rockets, and we'd like to bring Elmer Bennett in tonight to play for us. Well, that means he's going to a gate right then, and he's getting on a plane, and he's going to Houston, and he's playing for the Rockets that night. But we got to go on and play that night and try to win without Elmer Bennett. Yeah. So that, again, makes you a, a much better coach. And then the players pull hard together and do everything they can to still win the game, even though – you're losing a great player, whether it be an Elmer Bennett or a Sean uh, Leonard or, or whoever. Yeah. And see, again, I, I like that style and I like that point system at each quarter because, again, it, it kept everything competitive. You know, you're trying to win the quarter just like you were at the end of the game. So that way you are working on special situations and you're preparing the players for that next step up. And I'd like to see the G League kind of institute that because again, special situations are what the NBA is all about when right. it comes down to, you know, four seconds on the clock, sideline out of bounds, what play are we going to, you know, and then it just, it just makes it more competitive throughout because it's a game within the game. Well, what's great for the fans in the fourth quarter, if you're getting beat by 30 points and you see you probably don't have any chance to win the game, it's a brand new score, 0-0 zero, zero for the fourth quarter. So yeah. the fans stay just to see if you're going to win that quarter point. It's amazing, but it really was made to keep the fans in the stands. And it, it was tremendous, I think, for that league. And I'm just kind of shocked that some other league hasn't adopted it. See, I, I think it's great. And of course, I see the the TBT tournament now that's now a $2 million winner take all kind of tournament where they put that Elam rule in. And now you're seeing the all-star game last year kind of went with that Elam rule. So right. I think it's great when you've got forward thinking and you're always progressive thinking outside the box to enhance the game and enhance the product. Because the more that it, the, it's enhanced the product, the fans are going to be that much more engaged at all times. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because sometimes... It makes it tough for a CBA fan because just like whether we had Damon Jones or Jamie Fike from Michigan State or whoever, they come out to see their favorite player who's normally the best player. And then all at once they show up for the game and Bashan Leonard's not there because Pat Riley just called him up to the Miami Heat. 
Yeah, so yeah. Kind of, you know, lets the air out of the balloon. Oh, guys, we came to see Bashan and he's not here. Yeah. So again, the show must go on. So you got to find a way to win and find a way to entertain the fans. And that's what was so great about the CBA, the front office. We had great, unbelievable halftime entertainment. Mm. And that that a lot of people just came for the halftime entertainment. There you go. Well, and see, again, especially, especially when it was the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. <laughs> hey, there you go. That, that that's, arena, marketable. that's marketable. That's <laughs> marketable. Our, our arena in Oklahoma, the mirrored would hold 13,000. We'd, we'd have at the most 5,000 in there for one of our regular games. But when the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders showed up for halftime, 13,000 people every time. It was amazing. See, that's, that, that's great marketing right there. And coach, I'm sure somewhere in your office, do you have a picture with those Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders? I do. <laughs> That's my guy right there. My there you... It's in my man's room. Of course I have one. <laughs> you got to. I love that. Well, you know, and again, the thing that I like about, you know, the CBA and the scoring system, that next man up mentality was going to prepare them for other situations for their career and their market value is going to increase when they were able to step up and showcase their skill sets as well. But from a coach's standpoint and a strategic standpoint you always had to be on your toes and you're always playing a game of chess so for for coaches i, I think it's phenomenal and i would love to see other minor leagues uh you know pick that up right well i really worked hard trying to sell our players on winning the game rather than worrying about their stats yeah I was so worried about their stats to get to the next level and i said look the nba they're not stupid they want players that are coming off a team that's winning. They want winners. That's right. And they're going to come and watch you play. They're going to watch you play for the player you are, not how many points and how many rebounds. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to have points. It's great to have rebounds and block shots. But, you know, they're at the same time. They want to bring in a winner. So I did everything I could to get every player I could called up so another player would want to play for me because he'd say, okay, Coach Bergman will help me get to the NBA so I want to play for him on his team. That's right. Well, it was, you know, and you had to sell that to the whole team because otherwise you, the players can become very selfish when they're worried about getting to the Houston Rockets, the Knicks or whoever. Yeah. And see, that's right. And I think it's a great teaching point because again, you're preparing them, but again, from the NBA standpoint, they've already got 25 point scores. They've got 18 point scores. What other tangibles are you going to bring? You know, the energy, the defensive, the rebounding, uh, you know, just what asset do you bring to that franchise coming from a successful franchise like the CBA? Exactly. When you come from a CBA team or now the, the G League, they're bringing you in to play a role. Yes. Now, if you play that role so well, you may become a starter like a Damon Jones or like a Vashon Leonard, but a lot of times you're just there for a week, sometimes two, or 10 days or sometimes two 10 days. And you, if you make the team or get a contract for the rest of the season, that's fantastic. But there is a possibility you could be a John Starks, but again, John Starks was a heck of a player for the Knicks coming from the CBA, but never was a, what you would call the go-to guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he, he again he had a tremendous skill set and he was able to you know do things for Pat Riley with that New York team. But again, it, it wasn't he wasn't there just because of his scoring. You know, That's he's right. yeah the other tangibles that a lot of players seem to forget about when they have that disease of me. You know, same way with Tim Legler. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. Play Omaha Thanks. with Tim Legler. I mean, he was he put us up for thirty five or forty or forty two points, and I couldn't wait for him to get called up. <laughs> When he got called up, he proved that he belonged and, you know, had a great career. I know with the Washington Wizards and some of the other, but other NBA teams, but proved that he belonged. He even won the NBA three-point contest one year. Right. And, and now an ESPN NBA analyst. Exactly. Same yeah. way with Damon Jones. He's on ESPN putting his two cents worth in what he thinks about NBA players and NBA teams. You bet. And isn't it gratifying to know that you were a part of those young men's journey to see them be successful and still stay within the game in some capacity, whether it's uh, scouting or coaching or, you know, their front office positions that are, that are also available or broadcasting. Cause again, the, the, the game needs knowledge and they need teachers. And so I, I'm sure for you, it has to be fun for you to be sitting there coming off the golf course, grabbing a, grabbing a, a beer and be like, Oh yeah, there's legs, you know, breaking it down. Well, it is. It's 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 great. Just like Ira Newble. He was a kid that played for us in Idaho. 
a, a role player, defensive player, you know, just he's kind of like a, a Veramenko, not Veramenko, uh, golly, plays for the Jazz. The oh, Kir- Kirilenko, Kirilenko, Andre Kirilenko. Kirilenko. I was getting mixed up with another Russian player. <laughs> you, but, you spent some time over there. <laughs> but anyway, you know, Ira Newball, Newball was a defensive player and a great role player, and I talked him into staying because I thought he had a chance to make it to the NBA, and he did, and luckily – he, you know, he ended up with a great career with the Cleveland, you know, close to his home right there and, and uh, had a great career. Uh, I don't know how many years he played in, in the NBA, but made some good money and had a good career. And, and of course, what's great is when they send you an email or a letter and thank you for help oh. developing and helping make it, you know, just like Elmer Bennett, you know, he really sent me a great email after he retired. You know, he played with several NBA teams here, didn't quite st- ever stick. But he finally decided to go overseas for the money and made a fortune in Spain and extremely great player, European player. Yeah, see, Coach, there there is no price tag you can put on that when you That's get right. an email or a Christmas card or some kind of some kind of token of gratitude from the from the young men that you've been able to empower and uh, and you know lead them on their way on their journeys. There's just right. there's nothing like it, my friend. It's the same way with you know with college kids to get their degree and and go on and successful for himself, good husband, good father, got, you know, got a great family. And, you know, like when I see him homecoming, it's great to be around him. Yeah. See, once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the coach Scott Fields and you're enjoying another episode of the coach Scott Fields show. We got coach Russ Bergman, uh, send your comments, ask your questions, share this content because there's a lot of nuggets and a lot of insight being shared and a lot of expertise. And I'm, I'm honored and humbled to have, uh, my friend coach Russ Bergman here chopping it up and, and, and sharing that knowledge and wisdom with other coaches. And no matter what walk of life that you're in or what you're, trade or profession is there are still life skills that can be shared um you know through through these segments and coach i I appreciate your time this is just so fun to connect with you my friend well you do a great job scott and i feel blessed to be on your show well i appreciate that's very kind of you so now let's kind of go into the international stuff where you and i both have a passport and we've got a lot of ink and a lot of visas and stamps on that passport. And I can actually remember you giving me a call one time right before you went over the first time. And you're like, Scott, I haven't done this before. And I was trying to be like, okay, here's some things to look for. And hopefully that was able to help you a little bit, but uh, man, we've had some fun overseas, haven't we? It's been great. It's been fantastic. We've had some great European players that we help in practice in the games. We had some great American players, a lot of them former NBA players and, uh, you know, like Anthony Randolph, uh, wow. Derek Brown played for the Charlotte Hornets. I could go on and on with all the different NBA players. Uh, Carlos Delfino from Argentina on their Olympic team. Ruben Ochoa-Whiskey played for Seattle. Wow. Just on, on Melvin Booker played in the yeah. CBA, was player of the year in Missouri. His son, Devin Booker. So there's your, there's your bloodlines right there. But wow. we had some, you know, Marco Penseco, who was a starting point guard when Italy uh, won the <clears throat> won the silver medal in the Olympics. Uh, we had on and on and on. Garbajosa from Spain was on our wow. team. Yeah, we've had we had the best player in Russia, uh, Petrenko. Then unfortunately, he died in a in a, a terrible car accident the following summer. But uh, we had some great great players. Uh, Malcolm Delaney just played for the Atlanta Hawks. Well, he played for us in, in Krasnodar uh, for Locomotive Cuban. So Man. it's been, it's, you know, helping mold those players into a team with all these different coaches. And here's the other thing. You know, you have the NBA game, which is the same as the CBA game as far as the rules. Then you have the college game. The European game, the rules, or the Olympic game is a mixture of the NBA and college game. And myself, I actually like the European game better than the other two. But the reason why the NBA has those defensive rules is because of the big, quick, fast athletes. You would never be able to get through there and get some flashy dunks if you didn't have that defensive rule. But it really makes the European coaches really have to do a great job with spacing. And you have to sort of use some fake motion to get into your side pick and roll or middle pick and roll so they can't help, you know, on the weak side with that roll or whatever. So 
it is extremely challenging, a great, great game to coach. And, and I loved coaching at the European game. See, I, I have too. And I've told play, people for years that people should not sleep on the European game because now you're seeing more and more European players come over to the NBA and you're seeing more and more coaches adapt to more of a European style where there's more ball movement. And you saw coach Popovich, uh, you know, with the San Antonio Spurs that had multiple international players and they had longevity of success because of that style of play. And of course, coach Dan Tony was over in Europe, you know, wow. him coming back over here, uh, you know, now, and you see the, the, the pace that he played um, with, gosh, the, the Suns with the eight seconds or less. I mean, it's just great basketball, but I, I love the work ethic of the European players because they just soaked it up like a sponge and they didn't have that entitlement or that prima donna attitude. And man, they just would go hard for you. Well, Mike D'Antoni changed the NBA game. There you go. No question about it. I mean, when I got to Europe, I found out right away what the stretch four was all about because yep. – we would have an American player sometimes. It was great posting up, great from 15 feet. But I tell you what, if he couldn't shoot the international three, he wasn't starting. Yep. His minutes were limited. Yeah, it and, and, it, and it clogs it clogs everything, and you don't have the spacing. No question about it. And that's what Mike, he brought that, you know, uh, he brought that. Uh, he was in Benetton. He played there. He coached there. And he brought all that to the United States and started had ex extreme success with it with the Phoenix Suns. And then he's carried over to Houston. And now look at the NBA. Now you got to have four has to be a stretch for the NBA now, or he can't play. Yeah. And, yep. and now the centers, they don't have to be so, you know, so big and bulky and, and set on the block all the time. They want them to come out there and set that pick and roll. And they, you know, they're mainly scoring on the roll. They're not yep. scoring, you know, posting up. So yep. it's a different game in the NBA today. And Mike D'Antoni has had a lot to do with that. Yeah, because you, when you say that five man, it's pick and roll, pick and pop, pick and flare, right. where again, right. that floor stays spaced where you're giving that guard or that wing, you know, space to, be, you know, show creativity and, and, you know, get shots up. Because again, that pace that everybody's trying to emulate the Warriors from a few years ago, everybody likes it because it's entertaining. But man, you got to have the weapons who play that style to be successful that way. So I, li I love the innovators. I love the creativity. Uh, and just the European game has, has been phenomenal for, for us coaches, uh, for players. And, you know, people can have a nice career by going overseas for years. And it's not a bad lifestyle. I mean, it's, it's good basketball. It's a great life. And they get to see the world free and get to, you know, see all these different cultures and learn, make themselves more well, well rounded. I say enough about the European game and the European cities and the European countries. I mean, it's a, it's great for any college kid that can't make it in the NBA and very few do make it in the NBA. And, and of course, every year there's a new rap, new draft. So somebody's going to get cut and going to have to go somewhere. Yep. But I, the thing of it is, you know, when I first got to Europe, you know, I always knew that the Europeans could shoot so well. And then I found out why they practice shooting and they practice shooting and they practice shooting and they practice shooting some more. And that's why they're so good shooters. Yeah. And, and at the same time, the European kids and the, even the adults are extremely coachable. Yes. And they will, whatever you give them, they pay attention. You know, they don't act like they know it all. And that's one reason I think Popovich has been extremely smart. He's taken all those European players and fit them in, whether they, you know, was a really big player for them or just a role player but they're extremely coachable yep. and, and he coaches them too. That's right. That's exactly right. And see, and, and, and I love that point because uh, I, I experienced the same things that you've experienced and, and have seen for yourself. And some of the cities that you get to go to, like you said, the cultures that you're experiencing, the arenas in Italy and Greece and uh, gosh, Turkey and, and there in Russia. I mean, just, just phenomenal facilities and great restaurants after the game and just right. high level of basketball, just so much fun. Yeah. And they've got some unbelievable, crazy fans, whether it's in Serbia or whether it's in Turkey, like when we run the Euro challenge cup down there, I think it was uh, 2014. Wow. They had road flares and everything lit in the arena before the game. They're all yeah. standing and cheering for 30 Jan minutes and before, dancing. The, before the game even starts, maybe an hour. And they, yeah. they stand and cheer and sing the whole game. 
And yes. It's complete insanity, and you're playing a game without all that going on, and try to try to get verbal and, and hand communications to what you want to run. And it's a it's it's just a great great atmosphere to to coach and play the game of basketball. Uh, I I agree with you. And I, I remember taking my wife uh, over to Italy, and uh, she went to a game there. And of course, we were there with you know a famous Italian player who played for the Raptors, and he was kind of like the Michael Jordan of Italy at the time. So we went back to Bologna. We're watching a game there, and my wife could not believe the crowd because when the opposing team was shooting free throws, they were up on the basketball standard shaking the goal. And she's like, "They can't do that." I'm like. Babe, this is Europe. <laughs> well, they also can smoke in the arena. I remember first time oh. I went to Cyprus. I mean, there was so much smoke in the arena you couldn't hardly see. Oh man, yeah. The other oh. thing I need to make sure I, I bring out before we before we finish today, Lithuania, this country, mm. they love the game of basketball more than we do in the states. I mean, when their national team is playing, the whole country stops and watches the national team. They love their basketball, and they, they produced a lot of NBA players, great coaches, Kurt Denitis, I could go on and on. They, they, they are some, some great people, and I've been fortunate to work with a couple of them. Yes. And see, again, I, I can't speak highly enough about the European game and, you know, the fact that, you know, you've gone there and had had have, again, the medals and the trophies and the cups and things that you've won. Um, any club, any franchise, any team is lucky to have your expertise right there with them. And it's, it's a pleasure having you on here today, just chopping it up and uh, talking some basketball, my friend, because there's a lot of knowledge that you're sharing with a lot of people. And I hope that they understand the level of knowledge and expertise that you're sharing. I'll tell you what, there are a lot of uh, American pioneer coaches that went overseas and put on clinics for these European coaches back when they didn't have the knowledge that they do today. Yeah. But let's say, whether it was Bobby Knight, whether it was uh, uh, Beheim, a lot of these coaches would go to Italy, they'd go to uh, Spain, they'd go to a lot of places and put on clinics. And these coaches would eat it up and absorb it extremely, you know, yes. one to be a good coach. And now you have Sergio Scariola, assistant with the Toronto Raptors. I was fortunate to work with him a year there in Hemke in Moscow, Russia. Unbelievable, great coach. Same way with Sergei Becerovich. Uh, the Russian national team coach. I coached with him with two different teams and had great success with him. I think he's the best Russian coach there is. And that's why, of course, he's a national team coach. But he also played for the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah. So a lot of those coaches, that, that especially the coach in EuroLeague, and if you'll watch them, they do an unbelievable great job of coaching, the plays that they run, the execution, the way the players you know do what they need to do. If you'll go to YouTube – and look at and watch some of those European games, those even the European coaching clinics with FIBA, you will learn a lot and see a lot. I can't say enough about how far the European coaches have come in the last 30 years. You know, I, I agree with you. And I, I'm glad you've mentioned that because, you know, just as those players have always been coachable, those coaches were also evolving and learning and growing. And you can see that. And again, it's, it's manifested itself to the league and you see, you know, multiple international coaches on staff now uh, that, that do a great job and, and have a lot to offer. So again, the game is global. It is continuing to be global and, you know, guys like yourself who are ambassadors for the game, who've added to that enrichment. It's, it's, it's just a lot of fun. And again, man, this has been fun talking to you. Uh, you know, talking about the players earlier, you know, you talk about how great shooters they are. The thing that I also take to on that grassroots level, coach, those kids get drilled the fundamentals every day. So passing, shooting, screening, uh, I mean, their footwork, uh, just their skill set is so crisp compared to what American athletes are. Yes, Americans are probably better athletically, but as far as skill sets and, and tangibles, as far as ball handling and things, nowhere near the level of European players because you look at the European players that shoot and pass, that add versatility to, uh, to a weapon on a franchise, man, they are outstanding, my friend. Well, one thing that they're doing over there, you know, we have all these crazy rules over here with our high school and junior high teams. And I can even remember back when I was in high school basketball back in Illinois, you couldn't go to a summer camp or you were ineligible to play 
in the state of Illinois the next year, which is the most crazy rule you've ever heard of. But at the same time, they keep their same coach throughout the whole year. Yeah. In other words, they don't have high school teams and, and college teams. They have club teams just like That's right. just like Real Madrid. And so uh, just like Barcelona, they'll, they'll get a kid and they'll start with them, say, when he's 9, 10 years old, and he'll move up, say, from Hemke 3 to Hemke 2 to Hemke 1. But for 12 months, they're getting the same training. And, and, and Spain has such great schools that a lot of oh, kids, I don't, care those academies. I don't care if they're from Lithuania or wherever, they're going down to Spain to go to these basketball schools now. And they're getting this training 12 months of the year with great coaches. And most of the time, it's the same coaches. And so they're, they're, they're working their way up and getting them ready for the best team that they have, whether it be Hemke or whether it be, uh, you know, the uh, Lithuania, uh, the great team there, Zagulis or whoever, but they have that consistency where we don't. That's and right. Too many, the, too many of the kids in the United States, especially AAU, oh. they, they grab this great high school talent, put it in a van, throw, you know, six or seven talented kids together, and then they just roll the ball out most of the time. Yep. And so all at once, when you try to teach them, even at the college level, you know, sometimes I think, coach, you're messing with my game. Well, you're, we're not messing with your game. We're, yeah, trying, we're trying to, to teach you. <laughs> we're trying to make you a better player so we can be a better team. But they, the foreigners have a great mentality for absorbing and taking everything that you give them and teaching and, and trying to put it into practice. And that's one thing that we got to make sure that we get back to in the States. And I'm hoping that this coronavirus with all these families having to stay at home together, that we might get some more discipline that starts at home and then sort of spreads out from there. You preach coach preach. And I love what you're saying because again, internationally they do, they have that club system where they, you know, you, you, you call them, you know, ones, twos, and threes where it's like minis to cadets to scholars to yeah. juniors, to juniors, to, you know, the right. club B then club a, and right. it, it's a great, grassroots system that works year after year and again those kids just absorb it and they take coaching and again i would love to see the ncaa continue to uh hopefully be progressive thinking and do the right things with rules for for uh for student athletes and but again the grassroots level here at the aau we have to get back to coaches coaching and teaching because I've said it many times, so many coaches over coach and they under teach because they're afraid to teach because the player is just going to leave and go play with another coach because they don't want to be corrected. And that's, that, that's a problem when we got to correct that coach. Yeah, it's uh, right now it's a, uh, it's a little bit out of control. Yeah, it is. It is. But co coach, any last words you want to share with our viewers today? I mean, I don't even know how long we've been on here, but man, it's just, it seems like the time just flies because I just enjoy talking basketball with people who know and get it. You know, it's, uh, I've been very blessed to be, you know, I've always tried to recruit people that have good heads and good hearts. Mm -hmm. And I think when you get those kind of people, especially if they're an athlete, I think you can teach them everything else. You would love for them to be a shooter before you teach them the other four fundamentals. But I think those are the players that help you win championships. You know, I won a lot of championships as a head coach and assistant, but I also lost some along the way. And we all learn by losing some championships, what we need to do. And, you know, and sometimes you learn the hard way, but I found out if you get, good people, good kids, good players. I don't care if you're looking at them for the NBA, looking at them for the CBA, the D league, the G league, college, junior college, make sure you go after a kid and spend time finding out about the kid. If he has a good head and good heart, and basically he's going to be a winner for you. Coach. I love that. And I think that's a, that's a great nugget that you're sharing right there. Then hopefully, you know, these coaches have got their notebooks out and they're writing things down as they're hearing, hearing from an icon and a legend and a winner. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, this is coach Russ Bergman, a uh, multi-championship coach, uh, three-time coach of the year, uh, man, just 
success follows you. And again, uh, I appreciate your friendship. And I can remember us sitting, just talking basketball as we we're watching the NBA summer league. And I remember I made a comment one time. I was like, coach, you know, when the ball moves, the score moves. And you're like, I like that. I'm keeping that. And then, and then, and then here, here we are. We just try to, you know, be pirates and steal and evolve and, and help each other grow. No question about it. You know, I've, I've stolen from so many people and I've had, I had great college coaches, coach Press Maravich, coach Jay McCurry, wow. coach Maravich, an unbelievable great X and O. I played with the great pistol Pete. I saw what he did to mold him and make him to a great player. Coach McCreary, you know, again, it's not all about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmy's and Joe's. Amen. McCreary was a great psychologist, great at handling people. And I think it starts with handling people first. And that's so important in those two coaches. And from there, I've like, I've gone to clinic after clinic after clinic. And now luckily I've been to the point where and actually I've given clinics at a lot of different levels but I don't think you can get enough. Now you can just go to YouTube and see all kinds of clinics. But I think it's, it's uh, you got to have both. Uh, you've got to be able to make players understand that they're a person and not a piece of meat. Well, you know, I love, I love you sharing that. And it's, it's always an honor to sh- just sit around and talk basketball and share, share knowledge. And gosh, when you, when I can sit around people like you, um, there's nothing I can do, but be a better version of myself and continue to grow as a coach because that, that knowledge and wisdom and experience that you share, I'm telling you, I'd, I'd be crazy if I wasn't a sponge and soaking it up. Coach, I always love your show. I try to tune in when I can. If I can, I try to replay it later because you do a great job. You have some great guests on. So I can't say enough. I feel really blessed that you had me on today. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, Hey, from the bottom of my heart, you know how I feel about you, my friend. Maybe I need to share it with you more, but I thank the world of you. I love you. And uh, I've, I've just always had a, the utmost respect of the job that you do everywhere you go. So it's it, we're, we're privileged to have you on with us today. Because again, it's people like yourself that drive this show to make it so much better. Because uh, hey. I just I just enjoy having the platform to share it with people like you. Thank you, Scott. Well, hey, listen, be blessed, be safe, uh, get out there on that golf course. But I hope we get to uh, cross paths soon and continue to share knowledge and hopefully break some bread real soon, my friend. Let's let's hope we get back out on the court and cross path coached against each other or with each other oh you know what there would be nothing that would thrill me more if we could ever do that because man, that would be a lot of fun, my friend. All right, Scott. Thank you so much. I'm going to be praying for that. Be safe and uh, take care of yourself and, uh, you know, enjoy that sunshine and golf. I will. Thank you so much. Stay blessed, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, again, that is uh, Coach Russ Bergman, and he's just phenomenal. Great character and everything you want in a coach to uh, lead a club, franchise, or program, knowledge, at all levels that continues to to win and and share knowledge. So we appreciate coach being with us today. Uh, We're going to have another great show tomorrow, but man, has this been a lot of fun uh, with this one today. So let's share this content and get it out there for everybody else to continue to learn and grow from. If we can ever help you reach out, let us know how we can help. Stay blessed. Appreciate you coach. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, my friend. Great job.